Okay, guys, it is that time. Welcome, 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 welcome. We have had a ton of people um, log in over the last minute or two here. A ton of people. We are so excited to have you here. Um, my name is Jennifer McInnes. I am the Director of Marketing and Communications at SDI. Um, I have with me tonight Kit Carpenter. It sounds like a lot of you guys are students, which I love to see. And a lot of you guys are repeat offenders as far as these webinars go. I like seeing these names that I recognize. Well done. Um, we've got a ton of good stuff to go over tonight. So um, for those of you who are new and who may have jumped in in the last couple of minutes, just to catch everybody up, um, anytime you have a question or anything you'd like to chime in and say, you're going to do that in your questions section of the GoToWebinar dashboard. Um, that dashboard is, is usually either a column along the side of your uh, computer screen or sometimes it's along the top. You're looking for the area that says questions. If you, if you hit the little uh, addition sign there, it'll expand the whole sheet for you so you can see um, oftentimes, depending on what format you're using, what tablet or computer or phone you're using, um, it, a lot of times it'll show everybody else's questions too, so that can sometimes be helpful. Um, as we're going through here tonight, feel free to pop on over into that question section, and, um, and I'm going to keep a close eye on that all night here. We've had a couple really great questions already, so I'm super excited to kind of um, sink our teeth into this topic here tonight. Um, for those of you who don't know, Kip is kind of also a repeat offender for us. He's our, one of our lead instructors. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about him in just a second here. Um, but if you have not been on a Kip webinar before, prepare yourself because this will be a lot of fun. So um, let's get moving on the background information. We always at the beginning of these kind of talk a little bit about the school and about the um, guests that we have on for the evening. So um, without further ado, to tell you a little bit about what who we are and what we do, um, SDI is an online um, firearms technology school. Uh, we're accredited by the DEAC, um, recognized by the Department of Education. We offer at-home study options for anything from a simple armorer's course all the way up to a full associate degree. Um, it, and, and just so everybody is, um, is aware, I, I'm going to run through these really, really quickly. Um, the biggest credential we have is that Associate of Science and Firearms Technology degree program. Um, it's 60 credit hours long. Uh, below that is the Advanced Gunsmithing Certificate, and that's 32 credits. Both of those, you'll notice, have asterisks, asterisks <laughs> next to them. Say that three times fast. Um, and that is because they are, both of those are approved for use of most TA and VA benefits. So if that applies to you, we're happy to help you with that process. Um, the, the Associate of Science in Firearms Technology degree program is also um, available for eligible students to participate in um, federal student aid. So that's Title IV funding, Pell Grant, that type of thing. Um, if that is something that you may or may not be eligible for and want more information on, again, happy to help you with that. Um, we offer a non-credit ballistics and reloading certificate, um, an AR-15 advanced armor course, AR-10 advanced armor course, 1911 advanced armor course. Um, those bottom three you can either take by, your, by, by themselves as a standalone course or as part of one of those top two, the Associate of Science and Firearms Technology degree, or the Advanced Gunsmithing Certificate. So you get your choice of that. If you want to just take the one, you can. Um, if you want to do a build during one of the one of the big programs, you can do that as well. Um, we have a ton of really cool field study externship opportunities available nationwide. I think there are right around a dozen, 13 of them right now um, in many, many different states. Um, if you're interested in that, you do have to be in either the degree program or the um, Advanced Gunsmithing Certificate program. They're two to four weeks. Um, they're really great ways to get some hands-on training, so we do offer that to our students as well. Um, the information there, fieldstudy.sdi.edu, is a great place for that information. Or if you have any questions on the program, you can email me, jennifer at sdi.edu, and I'll get you to the admissions team, or straight up write to them, admissions at sdi.edu. Any of us would love to help you. So that's my spiel. Kip, let's talk about you a little bit. Um, give me a little rundown of your background, um, kind of what got you into the industry, all that good stuff. Well, first of all, I want to say hello to everybody and welcome to our webinar. And for your new students, welcome to STI. And I basically got into this stuff and had an interest with it basically as a kid. Um, I was in junior high school. My dad used to take me to the range pistol shooting with my godfather, who was a competition shooter, and he also did a lot of work on his own 1911s, so I kind of really got into it. And then I lucked out and had a friend of mine who lived on my street and became best friends, and his dad happened to be a gunsmith. 
and he worked for American Wholesale and he did a lot of their uh, warranty works and things of that nature. And he would bring guns home to me and his son Rick and say, hey, you guys want to go shooting this weekend? He'd bring them home in a box, torn apart, and say, put them back together. And that's basically how it started going with me. I developed a huge interest for it, and he taught me and his son several things from reloading to just all kinds of things about different weapons and how they work and how to fix them and what to do to them. And, and uh, I, I've said this many times, I feel like that by the time Rick and I were 18 years of age, we probably knew more than a lot of the so-called gunsmiths that were in our area. So. From there, it just kept growing. Uh, I never did it as a career until I got older, but I just kept doing it for friends and family, and I was on some uh, dietary protection teams, or some security work, so I was always the armor, or different things of that nature. And uh, up in Tennessee, about, oh, it's been about four or five years now, uh, I moved up there and needed to do something for a living after the big recession we had. I uh, also had a death of family. My mother was up there. I needed to go up there and be with her. So <clears throat> I settled in a little town called Columbia, Tennessee. There wasn't a lot going on. wasn't a lot to do. So I said, well, I need to figure out something I could do to make some money here. And, and I looked around, and one thing that was in such a big demand up there was everybody was in shooting and hunting and, and uh, trap shooting and things like that. So I joined the gun club, and I basically hung out my shield and started from there and grew from a little tiny shop in the garage to the biggest shop and probably of all middle Tennessee there that had a complete machine shop and all kinds of cool stuff in it and we did that within three years and that's uh, about the time I was approached by SDI. Um, I'm not a spring chicken, get up there in age and decide that you know what this is what I've always wanted to do was teach and now I'm with SDI full time. And we love him dearly. <laughs> uh, everybody's got amazing things to say about Kip. If you, um, in fact, if you're one of Kip's students right now, let me know. Put it in the little question section here. I want to take a quick roll call. Oh, there we go. Yep, got him coming in already. Um, they should. They should be studying. But okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Maybe you can give them a little pass for this one hour. <laughs> yeah, we. Can do that. Oh my we can gosh! Do that. Look at everybody. Look at this. Uh, a ton of people are either current or former students of yours, Kip. Very oh, wow, that's great. Well, I'm glad they came back. You know, I, you know how I feel about my students. So. Awesome, awesome, uh, awesome. Um, so let's go ahead and dive in. Um, there are a couple things that I want to make sure we touch base on tonight, and I think the big ones are always going to be how do you make that, how do you take that leap? You know, how do you make the decision to either start gunsmithing outside or go full time or open a business you know what I mean I think a lot of people wonder about like how do you how do you take that leap um, well and then so let's start there because that seems like a good starter point anyway you know okay well we can do that and uh, the first thing I want to say tonight is we're going to go through everything that I can I'm going to basically tell you how I did things it's not necessarily the the set in stone way you'll be successful doing it but it's, it's what I did to get going. And uh, I also want to say that I'm not an attorney, and I'm not an attorney spokesman, so <laughs> we, always get a lot, we always get a lot of legal things yeah. that pop up there, but we'll do the best we can to answer them, but we will refer you to who you should go to. So getting started, how do I make the decision to do this? Well, it's really you have to do some soul searching of yourself. First of all, you need to know that you have the skills to do it. Now, I'll go back to that in just a second. The second thing you need to know <clears throat> and make your decision is, is do you really want to start your own business? Uh, let me just destroy the myth right now. Anyone who tells you that starting your own business is uh, just a piece of cake and you just, you know, roll, you know they, they, they obviously never owned a business. A lot of hard work, a lot of dedication, a lot of long hours, okay? But it's also very rewarding. You be your own boss. You set your hours, you get to know your clientele, and I will tell you this, based on my experience, once you get established and you're good, you won't have to worry, they'll come to the door. So word of mouth is everything, and, and we're also going to go about some ways, different ways to advertise some things I did, and we also have an expert here tonight who knows all about the media stuff, and that's <laughs> Jennifer, so she will cover all that too. And. And uh, that's basically the main thing you need to do is just ask yourself if you're married, sit down with your wife and discuss it, you know, because this can be a life-changing thing. You may just want to do it part-time, 
you may uh, decide, you know, hey, I'll go to work for somebody in a company. There's nothing wrong with any of those things. It just, it just, but you need to know that whatever you do, and this is the biggest thing I can be honest with your customers. If somebody comes to the door with something and you don't know how to do it, tell them you don't know how to do it. You don't have to make yourself look like an idiot and say, well, I don't know how to do that. But you can say, hey, you know what, I've been training all kinds of things, but I've not been training that yet. I'm, I'm planning on getting that training. Let me get a little further ahead, but right now I can't do that, but I can do all this other. You will find that your customers will respect you more just for telling them that and being honest with them because that tells them right away you're an honest guy or woman. And they want and they want that because let's face it, we all probably have stories out there, including myself, of different places that we may have gone to and customer service has not been good or we've been lied to or we got taken advantage of. Don't do these things. That's that's the sure way to put yourself out of business. Sure way to keep yourself in business, to be hundred percent honest and hundred percent honest about your skills and know what your skills are and your confidence level is. Certainly if you've never done something before, you don't want to take that job on unless you've done it and practice it on uh, what I call a practice gun. That's something you can pick up cheap, drill holes, whatever you need to do. You don't really care about it, but that gives you the experience. Uh, for me, I had to learn to do that. I had to learn a machine. I had to do all those things. But it's interesting, the picture that she has up right now, that wonderful guy that's still there to the left, I was very fortunate to have him come into my life. I could do a lot of things machine shop wise, but that man right there, he was uh, into gunsmithing, but hadn't really done it full time, but he was pretty good at it, but he had been a machinist for 30 years. So he was the perfect fit for me. That came later. We'll get to that later. Okay. But the whole, the whole point I'm getting at is, is associate yourself with people that you know, first of all, you can trust. I can go into a whole spiel about partners and business partners. So my my thing is is if you don't have to do it, don't do it. <laughs> sure. Sure. Save yourself the save yourself the headaches. Jennifer will tell you that she knows the statistics as well as I do. Partnerships usually do not end up well. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so so my my whole point is if you don't have to do that, don't do that. Yeah. Now, the next next big question since we're talking about business and getting started is the biggest question I get is where do I get the money? Right. I was just going to say that. Somebody um, did ask if you started with a small business loan. Well, um, let me tell you, my small business loan was to myself at about $400. <laughs> oh, broke the bank. <laughs> yeah, and that's, that's the truth. And I spent most of that on uh, doing doing business cards with uh, that company. You can get them for real cheap for 500 You all know who probably know who I'm talking about. They send ads to everybody. Uh, you can get cards real cheap that way. You you can do a lot of other little things. I did have a couple of T-shirts made for myself because I found that with me, as you can see, I'm a big guy there. I was a walking billboard, and I think within the first two years of my business, everybody in Columbia, Tennessee, thought that's the only shirt I owned. So, <laughs> Good for you. I mean, because it was everywhere. Okay. Yeah. So that was what what you know I really 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 went after. So that's decisions you have to make. You have to be prepared to do it. You have to want to do it. You have to really um, uh, know what you can do. You also have to discover things. Like there's another perfect timing, Jennifer. That pistol that you see right there, just to give everybody a quick rundown, I couldn't afford bluing tanks. Now I'm going to ask all of you, does that look like a hand blue gun? Because it is. I developed my own, I went back to the old gunsmithing books, and I found a recipe that would do that kind of a finish without a hot blowing tank. Yeah, I know I'm going to get a thousand questions now, how do you do that? <laughs> Nicholas, <laughs> no way. <laughs> but that's something, that's something that SDI are working on, I are working on, so you know, but that, that will come, but yeah, something like that. And we don't, and let me tell you something, if you're a student at SDI, we don't have a problem telling you at all. So those of you who are wondering, now you know what you got to do. So, but but seriously though, that that was a, a, a firearm that came to me from a sheriff's deputy who was retired, who was not well. He wanted uh, to have he carried this gun for years. It was pitted. It was really bad off. It was rusted. Okay, but he always loved the real deep, shiny, cold blue that you can't get anymore. I delivered it to him with that right there. Nice. And, 
the man really liked it. And did I charge him for it? No. You said, why? I was just starting out. First of all, his story touched me. I had a little bit of law, back, law enforcement background. It's a brotherhood. Uh, soldiers out there, they know exactly what I'm talking about. They, they have that same kinship with each other. Uh, this is also a way that I knew that if I did this, that he was going to go show every deputy sheriff in that sheriff's department. Right. And sure enough, and sure enough, they started coming to my shop, folks, including their SWAT guys, snipers, etc. Right. So, so this is the whole point I'm trying to make. If you're confident on your level and you're willing to work and work hard, you can do this. This is not rocket science. This is this is another form of mechanics. And if you guys know that you have the talent and, and the drive and the will to learn and to read and continue on, we give you the basics. It's up to you to keep on going. Um, Jennifer's heard me say many times, I have been reading book after book after book after book for years from all kinds of famous firearms people. I do this with everything I'm interested in. And so if you're a reader or if you like to learn things, this is going to be the great thing for you because you never stop learning in this business. I have not stopped learning yet. Yeah, absolutely. And let me stop you right there, Kip, for just a second. Um, we're getting a, a little bit of um, feedback on your microphone. Do you have your earphones in, or are you going computer audio on me? Um, computer audio. Let me see if I can turn this. Just, How's that? Just say something else again. How's that there? That's a little better. I think that takes a little bit out of it. Um, yeah, it almost, it, you're right, Jer Jeremiah says it sounded like wind in the background or, or anything like that. Oh, well, that could be my fan in the background because I do live in Florida. Oh, well, there you go, yep. <laughs> <laughs> so, let me um, see if I can turn that in. Okay, cool. And then I do have some really good follow-up questions. You guys have been um, rocking it on the question section. Such good questions. We're going to get to as many of these as we can, so. Yes. Um, okay. So, um, a couple people have asked things along the lines of certification. So, you've talked about education a little bit. Um, can you walk people through what, you, you know, you've got a, a laundry list of certifications. How did you decide which ones mm -hmm. to do and what were those processes like for you? Well, um, I'll be honest with you. Um, I've tried a lot of the online guns with schools and was really disappointed. Sure. SDI is the one I wish I would have taken, I'll be honest with you. Mm -hmm. That's one reason why I'm here teaching. Um, the chair of this this uh, uh, organization is a good friend of mine. We've had many, many talks. He was on the same wavelength and the same goals that I and several other people were suggesting they needed for the industry. We, as you know, Jennifer, we partnership up with some of the big names in this industry and we're always getting feedback. We have a lot of friends out there. so. That's what we're gearing up to try to do. We try to teach you some history. We try to teach you some old stuff because you need to know that. You know, uh, you're going to get guns in there from all walks of life, and I'm talking about from the 1800s up. So you got to know how to work on everything, right. and that's what we try to do. We're trying. We and every year we try to do more and more and more, and our staff just works really hard to do that. So that's where I suggest you start. Now, as far as my other certifications. Most of those are all from the industry. I got those from the armor ship students like Barrett, uh, Glock, other people like that. You'll be able to do all that stuff too. Once you have that FFL, folks, that's your Magic Kingdom ticket right there. When you get that FFL and you go into business and you have that FFL, all the invitations will be there for you to go take the armor schools and you'll be able to do that. I'm certified in every Barrett rifle there is. I'm certified in all the Glocks. Um, you will be able to do the same thing. If you want to go to Smith West School, you'll be able to go to Smith West School. If you want to go to the the uh, different, unless they change their criteria, where they, when I don't think they will, and you have the money to pay the fee, you're there because it takes that FFL though, and it really does. That is to keep, um, let's just say, the non-true gunsmiths out of the out of their schools. They don't want that. Um, they're looking for the people who are dedicated to this task and are going to do right by their customers. So you, you can do all that. Those are the certifications I recommend. As far as my other credentials, you see I'm, a, I'm a, an NRA certified instructor. Um, I, uh, I suggest all that. 
since you're going to have your FFL, because folks, when you get your FFL, I'm just going to touch on this briefly because you kind of need to know this. When you get that FFL and you are working as a gunsmith, you are also a licensed firearms dealer. It's the same one that covers you for both. So you can sell guns, you can buy and trade, you can do all that. Now you'll, the F, the, when you go get your FFL process, ATF will go over all this stuff where you have books and everything else, you have to keep your records, but you will be right there. Uh, once you do that, okay, and there's, there's a, that was my first step up store right there. You can see I sold merchandise, I, I did things like that, but you also will just have so many doors open up, you will have industry people contacting you, you'll be able to get wholesale, you'll be able to get uh, uh, different seminars and things like that would be requested to you. I got my firearms instruction license by NRA in the state of Tennessee to teach handgun carry permits and protection in the home and all that, because why not? If you have the license to cover you, take full advantage of it. Everything you can do to create revenue for your business is going to do nothing but help you if that's what you want to do. So it really the sky's the limit. You, you pretty much decide how I want to do it. Do I want just a repair shop? Do I want to have a full shop? Do I want to uh, teach? You can do that. Um, I've got a bunch of people with questions about the FFL, and I know that this is, some of this is going to be outside of what you know because it's all, you know what I mean, because you may not have dealt with some of these different types of FFLs. Um, do you know which type of FFL, um, let me do this one first. Uh, Peter asks, what type of FFL is needed to be a good gunsmith? An O1. An O1, okay. Just that simple, an O1. That covers you as a gunsmith and a firearms dealer. Okay. That's the same one that both gun shops have. Your local gun shop has an O1. Uh, that, that's going to cover you to work on anything. Now, I understand. Now, well, let me say by saying that, though, this is as when I was out practicing. You know, I sold my shop and closed right. it down. But, and I uh, think uh, an 07 yeah. is also very common nowadays. Is that right? 07s have become very common. It's just depending on what you want to do. We have a lot of people out there who want to be manufacturers and things of that nature. That's kind of a different step. Uh, just starting out, I don't think you, unless you've got a lot of money to back you, you may not want to go pursue that at first. My suggestion is to throw your basic shingle out there. You can always upgrade your license anytime you want to. Okay. okay? It's just it's just a matter of fees. And and once you have that O one in place, you've already done you've already passed the backgrounds, you've already had the interviews, they know who you are. Right. So anything you want to step up to is going to be easier as long as you follow their criteria and do as they say, they being the ATF. Um, you follow those criteria and so you can make those criteria, you'll be fine. Now, as far as the regulations, they change a lot, and the last couple of years have been a lot of changes, so there's a lot of things up in the air. There's a lot of things that we we were told, but we're not sure about, and this and that and the other. That's where I tell you to check with your local ATF people. ATF people are not the big bad wolf that you hear. They're very nice. I got nothing but good things to say about them. They've been over backwards to help me, even when I had stupid questions. They they were right there, there was no stupid question in their eye. And I had a wonderful agent that came to my house, which this is what they'll do, folks. Let me just, let me just walk them through the process real quick. You, you apply for your FFL, you fill out the pack, you send in your, your fingerprints and all your background information. You get all that paperwork done, you send in your fee. You're going to get a confirmation from them. They're going to contact you, a field agent that's going to come to your house or wherever it is that you're setting up your business. And the only criteria is you have to make sure you're zoned for it, that you have a city and county license, you have those in place, and have those in place before you, you file for your FFL. It makes life a lot easier. You can send those copies with them. It just makes things go a lot quicker. They come out, they sit down with you, and they go through everything. And folks, I mean everything. It's usually about two to three hours long. They cover what you got to do, how to do it, how to fill out your books, what you need to do for records, how to keep those records, and, and all those kinds of things. From that process, if everything goes smooth, that agent reports back to their supervisor that, hey, this, this person is ready to go. I felt very confident with them. They know they're, they're good. 
From there, he signs off on it, or she, and they send it back to the main office and in uh, Virginia there, and then they look it over, they make sure all the, the, the uh, dots are crossed and everything's there and your fee is there, and then they process it through. The process can take anywhere from three months, uh, I've heard uh, even up to over six months. For me, it took right about, right about three and a half, and I was at that point just like everybody was worried, oh my God, I'm not going to get it. Well, guess what? What's the mailbox? And there it was. There was my FFL. <laughs> And that's going to be a great feeling for you because now you can say, hey, I am good to go. And the reason that is, folks, is you cannot work on people's firearms legally unless you are a licensed FFL gunsmith. There's a lot of people say this and that and the other. Well, I'm just telling you straight up what I've been told by ATF and what I know to be true. And that is the thing. Now, if you work on your buddy's guns and your, your uncle's guns and you're not charging a penny for it, you're okay there, but why? You know, you're in this to make some money. So do it the right way, and you'll never have to worry about the wrong way to catch it up with you. And that's my belief on it. And you're going to find out that the ATF is there to help you, not hurt you. They're not. They're not the. They're not out to get you at anything. In fact, they're far from it. They're so busy. They want you out there doing the right thing, and if if they want to tell you how to do the right thing, so you are doing the right thing. So don't don't be afraid of that. Okay, great. Tons of questions about FFLs um, and other things, you know, city, do you have any idea when it comes to city and county laws how they would go about what those are or anything like that? Well, the easiest way to do is walk down to your local uh, city hall in your county and ask them. Go to the business section, go to your zoning section, make sure wherever you're going to do it that you're zoned for it. Okay, now I'll give you an example. I started in my garage. Home-based businesses were okay, but they had never approved one for a gunsmith. Oh, great! Here we go. So <laughs> they asked me. They asked me, "Well, what are you going to do?" And I told them, "Well, I'm going to fix guns. That's what I'm going to do. I'm not really going to sell anything there because at that time that was the truth. I didn't know the plans to do that. I just wanted to repair firearms and do get jobs from gun shops and fix their stuff and take them back." And they said, "Well, that's great." So the guy's like, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Can you wait just a couple of minutes? And they walked out with a piece of paper saying I had been zoned and approved to have a gunsmith shop in my oh, garage. Cool. That's awesome. So, you know, more, more likely you could do that. And the same with the county license. They said, okay, here's your occupational for that. Here's your occupational for your city. And you send those copies with your, your uh, FFL package to the government. And it shows them that you've already taken care of it. And it just makes life a lot easier. It's really cool. simple. Um, and that kind of goes up against another question. Um, uh, Billy asked, if, I'm not sure if this would be the case for me, but if my HOA have, has issues with me having an FFL for my house, um, will I have to have a different physical address? Um, and well, I would say, if, yeah, <laughs> HOAs are their own kind of beast. <laughs> uh, every dragon's a little you different. You have they like say, to have uh, experience uh, in that uh, um, topic. There. Well, uh, yes, I know a little bit about HOAs. <laughs> but... Uh, I don't know if to stay away from them. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. I'm just kidding. Uh, all, all kidding aside, yeah, that's going to – usually the, your HOA rules will spell out right from the beginning when you moved in there whether or not they allow businesses and things of that nature or business trucks and all that. You know, they get as petty as that. So um, I would say go back and look at your HOA rules. And here's another thing. That was a good question because it brings up a key point of the number three thing I was going to have them do, and that is find you a attorney and talk about things with your attorney when you go to setting up your business. It can save you a lot of hassle, a lot of headaches. Attorneys, believe it or not, have a lot of good advice for setting up a business, especially if fire business about liability issues and things of that nature. Okay, so. In your case, I would say, because you have an HOA, I would discuss this with an attorney, let them see your HOA rules, because you may find that if it's not spelled out in your HOA, you may be okay, and that would take an attorney to do those kinds of things and make that determination. So with that being said, I, I, I would highly, strongly suggest that you get an attorney. It saves you a lot of headaches. And also impresses the uh, IR, or not the IRS, but the ATF people when you tell them these are the steps I took before I applied. 
that tells them that you're really serious and you're really an up and up citizen and, and that makes them feel a lot more comfortable with you too. And along that lines, the other thing I'm going to say real quick, just to go in hand in hand with the attorney, is insurance. Good. A bunch of people are asking this. That's good. Insurance is a big deal. I don't usually give plugs for insurance, but you know what? We're SDI and we work well. And I'm just going to go ahead and give this plug because I understand now that it's getting very difficult to get insurance. And premiums are super high now with a lot of people that will even cover you because of the firearms industry. Um, we've had a lot of, um, well, let's just say a lot of anti-firearm stuff going on in the United States in the last couple, three years. So I will tell you where I got mine. And it was very affordable. I got mine through the NRA. I joined the business affiliation and I got my insurance through them and I only paid about $1,600 a year, which is cheap and it covered me for over a million dollars of, of liability insurance per gun. Okay, perfect. Good, good, good. Um, oh, you know what? I want to just interject here really quickly on the FFL stuff. A ton of people are having a bunch of questions on FFL, um, and particularly about how to get one and whether or not we do that at SDI and things like that. Their um, curriculum does touch on the FFL application process, um, the different types of FFL laws and regs, that type of thing. Um, within the degree in the Advanced Gunsmithing Certificate Program. Um, but anybody, regardless of whether or not you are um, uh, an enrolled student or anything like that, if you'd like, we do partner with a company called FFL123.com. Um, they sell little, you know, almost dummy-proof kits, really. You know, that's what I would do if I were <laughs> going to apply for an FFL. You know, they walk you through step by step by step. The little online, um, you, you get access to an online account. If you are interested in that, if you need that little helper, um, then if you'd like to, they have set up a partnership with us where if you do that on our website, sdi.edu, scroll all the way down to the bottom, there's a teeny little thing that says shop down at the very bottom. Um, if you buy it that way, they take, I think it's like normally $39.99 and you get it for $25 or something on our site. So you get a nice little discount if you did want to do it that way. Um, <clears throat> And thank you, Dan, for reminding me of that. Dan um, chimed in and said that he uh, purchased one. It's been very helpful and goes into good detail. So if anybody's interested in that, we do have that partnership. Um, it's in the online store, which will actually, uh, pro tip for you guys who are on here tonight, um, it's actually going to, we're going to be bulking up that online store uh, in the next probably three weeks, I would say. Um, well, we've got a couple really cool things to start selling in there too, just like pride gear and that type of deal. So keep an eye out there. Um, it's called an FFL123.com. Um, they call it a kit, but really it's more like an online account. You'll get a login for an online account, essentially. And then once you're there, you have access to all of the member-specific information. Um, but if, if you'd like to check them out, the actual website is FFL123.com. I'd like okay, to also cool. say that I also like to say that lots of people have gotten their FFLs by using his kit. He's been around a long time. Great guy. And yeah. Yeah. Brandon he is. He really is. Really and and when I applied for mine, I didn't know it. I did it the hard way. I did it on my own. And a friend of mine, he actually had a, had a gun shop. He did it through FFL one two three, and it was a breeze and a snap. And I'm like, boy, I should have could have saved myself some headache pills. So. <laughs> right. Right. So yeah, I would suggest them too, especially for twenty-five bucks, folks. Come on, we're we even right. getting something that cheap anymore. Right, right, right. Um, I promised somebody I would ask their question next. What is this? Um, I'll ask that next. Oh, insurance. We just went over it. So Kevin, if you need any follow-up questions on that, um, let me know about that. But I, I think we're good on the NRA thing. Pending any follow-up questions there. Sure. Um, and, and another thing with insurance is just common sense, folks. Right. Business. Business. What are the two things you need in business? You've got to have liability insurance. I don't care if you sell shoes. Right. You know, if, somebody, <laughs> if somebody falls in your store or, or gets hurt or like you see that rack back there, those, those uh, little pegs that stick out, somebody scratches themselves on one. You know, most people aren't going to do anything, but there's always that person that's going to sue. So you have to protect yourself with insurance, and it's good to do that because when you have insurance, they have attorneys, and they handle these things for you, and it makes the sleep a lot better at night. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I have a good kind of segue question. Chris asks, what if you cannot run your business from home? How can you get an FFL? Can you transition us through 
um, the difference between running a business out of your home and, and leasing well, out space or buying space? Well, let's talk about that. I was getting ready to go to that point in yep. the way of how to get going in a business. Okay, so you, you can't do it. They say, no, you can't have it. And you can't afford to go rent a space. What can I do? Well, you can do what I did to start off with till I had my FFL. I went and knocked on every gun, gun business's uh, door in town. Do you have a gunsmith? No. Would you like one? Right. And what I, and what I suggested to them was, hey, you know, I'll, I'll give you, you know, X amount. If you'll uh, send me the customers, I'll come into your store, you log them in your books, and I'll do the work and then bring the gun back. And you say, well, Kip, is that legal? Yes, it is. As long as that gun store, <clears throat> excuse me, takes in the, the firearm and they log it into their book, you're covered because you're working for that store technically. Okay, so he can have you work on it there or he can release it to you to take to your house to work on and then bring it back. And you can do that all day long. And I've done that. Now, I will say this, if you're going to go that route, let's make sure that you double check with yourself, make sure that ATF still approves of that. It has not changed that rule. That rule was in fact when I was doing it. But I'm telling you right now, that's a way to get going. It's a way to build your reputation. And guess what? When you do finally open your shop, those gun shops are still going to send you all your business. You're your gunsmith. Right. Just take good care of them and make sure you do a good, honest job because if you make them look bad, forget it. <clears throat> They're going to make you look bad. So, you know, you, you can work that out. And that's where I would do. That's what I would start with right there. Your other alternative, if you can't get that done, is you're going to have to rent a place. And mm -hmm. sometimes you can work with your landlords if you tell them what you're trying to do. Be honest. There again, being honest could get you a lot of things. That spot you're seeing right there, I rented that. That was a pretty good sized shop with a uh, shop in the back for all the gunsmithing stuff. And it was, it was pretty good size and got it for 500 a month. Oh, there's me and my joys at the Barrett factory. Yeah, I was, I'm trying to find more pictures of your shop. Oh. I always say that because everyone wants to know are those are my toys. And it's like, yes, I wish. Yeah. <laughs> so, right. But, but seriously, guys, um, that would be your next choice. You're going to have to. The one thing you need to make sure when you rent a place is you got to have somewhere that, where people are going to find you. And you got to have somewhere that's going to be secured. You're going to need an alarm system. Although, you know, your insurance, it's just going to get you better rates and stuff, but it's common sense. You're going to be dealing with firearms. You want a big safe to lock things up. Uh, you want a safe big enough that they're not going to carry out. You know, if nothing else, bolt it to the floors. Make it hard. And, uh, and another thing, too, is, is make sure all your law enforcement know where your shop's at. If you're good to the cops, the cops are going to be good to you. Sure. So let them know. My, my, my law enforcement officers always got discounts, and I'm very pro-law enforcement, so I'm just going to come up there and say it. My local officers had my personal cell phone number, right. and I used to tell them that during the night, if something falls off your Glock or any of your firearms and you're on duty, don't hesitate to call me. I can be at that shop in less than 15 minutes. That's I don't great. Care what time it is. That's awesome. You, that get that, you get that kind of of uh, reputation with them, and they, they keep an eye on your shop, but also they tell a lot of people about you, too. So sure. don't be afraid to to get out there and reach to your community. Be part of your community, and you'll find your community really wants to be part of you. A um, couple follow-up questions here on this type of operations that we're talking about right now. Um, any idea if the ATF would approve a room in a house that's out of the foot traffic area? I'm guessing like listen, a back bedroom, that type of thing. <laughs> listen, the ATF approved my garage, okay? <laughs> How much more? <laughs> <laughs> right. The, right. The ATF doesn't care if you fix them on your kitchen table. Yeah. Your wife may, but the ATF doesn't. Right, yeah. Okay? Totally right. different approval process. <laughs> <clears throat> That guys, to show you how lax it could be, when I got my FFL, I wasn't even required to have a gun safe. By the ATF. I'm so glad you said that because somebody did ask um, any idea if you know, uh, like, what's required as far as gun storage to get an FFL. 
All it says is it must be stored and properly secured. That okay. was the way the wording was when I got mine. I'm probably sure they haven't changed it. You might, you guys can check because it'll be in all the rules and the do's and don'ts. And I know uh, one, two, three even covers all this too. Right. But their main concern is that you know what you're doing with the laws and this and that and the other. That's right. that's more of an insurance thing than it is an ATF thing. Sure. But naturally, ATF wants you to have a safe and lock things up. I mean, common sense. Your, your agent will tell you that usually when they're there with you. You know, come on, man, lock it up. You, okay. Lock people's guns up. You know, common sense. You don't want you don't want people, you know, to know that you're doing something like that and know that you're an easy target. Come on. Right. So, you know, invest a little money and a little pride and get you a safe that's worth locking up, you know. Any recommendations even, on even if you just use a steel cabinet at first, a, a, an eighty nine yeah. dollar one. Just something you can bolt down, lock up, and you say, Hey, I tried to keep it secure again and that's gonna help you with your insurance company. Sure. Um Okay. Uh, oh, I, I promise Dan, uh, Dan has been asking um, if you know anything about registering with ITAR. I don't know a whole lot about registering with ITAR, um, so I, I really don't feel like I'm confident to really answer a lot of that on there. Um, it, obviously, Dan probably knows a lot about ITAR, so yeah. <laughs> I would say so the questions that you have about ITAR, I would just contact them. Uh, once we handle that directly and just sure. go from there. Okay. That sounds good. Um, okay, so let's move on. I, I know a lot of people have a ton more questions on FFL, um, but let's, since we're kind of towards the end of the hour here already, but we can go over a little bit, I'm sure. Um, let's go ahead and move towards the types of services. How do you decide what to offer? How do you decide what to charge? That type of thing. Okay, this is the big question because there is no real book or anything out there, right. job or books or anything that say this is what you charge. Not yet, anyway. <laughs> but anyway, we. Uh, <laughs> uh, long story short is is know your community. I tell my gunsmiths don't start out any less than forty five dollars an hour. That's it. Yep. It's that simple. Then you can go up from there. I commanded. Once I was well known and was really doing well, um, I commanded anywhere about eighty-five dollars an hour. However, folks, keep in mind I had a heck of a reputation by then that me and my machinists had worked very hard to earn. So, you know, we 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 could command it because of what we were doing. But when I first started out, I was forty-five dollars an hour, and I had nobody really complain about. It. Although you will always have somebody that's going to complain about it. But sure, and that's just labor, right? You're talking about that's just labor, flat labor. That's not including your parts. That's yeah. not including anything else. That's labor. You've got to make a living. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> so, you know those bills are going to come in, especially if you got rent and stuff out there. Those bills are going to come in, and you have to stay with the inflation. And and uh, you, trust me, when you open your business, you're going to learn more about business than you ever thought you were going to learn. Oh, I'm you will sure. Know. Sure. Yeah, and and, and uh, hey, you know me, I'm not a gunsmith, but for, from a marketing perspective, I absolutely agree with that because um, there's a perceived value of things, you know, so you oh. want to make sure that you're not pricing yourself so low that people are worried about that whole you get what you pay for exactly. you know, type, of, type of situation. So. Exactly. And, and, and you know, and it's, another thing goes to this too is, is uh, and this is the, the thing that's most important when you, for me anyway, was I got a CPA right off the bat. I'm not a tax person. I don't know write-offs. I don't know what, what's out there and available for me. And thank God I did. Right. I had no headaches. Folks, let me tell you something. You paid them. I paid my accountant $150 a month. And it was well worth it. I went to sleep every night. I didn't worry about IRS. I didn't worry about nothing. And I never had an issue. And I got all the deductions and all kinds of things that I would have never even thought about. He had me saving receipts for everything. That's another thing, folks. Save your receipts. Um, you'd be surprised what can be written off and what is a write-off. Even if you go to your shop and you buy a hamburger, that's a write-off. Fuel's a write-off. So there's all kinds of things out there. But your CPA will cover all that with you. So you, if you don't know uh, how to do that kind of thing or you're not good with that kind of thing, definitely get your CPA. Save you some headaches. And the CPA, we did have a question earlier about um, whether or not it's better to incorporate, do it, you know, an S corp, a C corp, a LLC, yada yada yada. CPA will help you with that too, because a lot Absolutely. of that is going to be individual, 
you know, what kind of collateral do you have, what type of liabilities do you have, et cetera. Um, Absolutely. It depends on how you're going to structure your business. I was a sole proprietorship, so, I mean, it just depends on how you're going to do things. Um, it, but Jennifer's right. You, you need to go to the CPA to make those kind of decisions. Absolutely. Okay. Um, let's. A couple people have asked um, if it's a good idea to specialize in certain weapons, um, and then along those same lines, a couple people also said, "What about reloading?" You know what I mean. So, talk to me about um, specializations within your business. Absolutely. If you're good at something, let them know it. Yeah. If you're a, a modern firearms guy and you're great at AR-15s or whatever it is, let them know it. Let them know that's your specialty. There's nothing wrong with that. But don't close the door on knowing all of your weapons. Know your old stuff and your new stuff because I'm telling you folks, you're going to be working on it. And that's the other thing too. You don't have to start off, and, you, and I've said this in lots of webinars, you don't need a machine shop. You, don't need, you need a bench and some tools when you get started. Nobody's going to come to you to build them a custom rifle right off the bat. Right. They've got to get to know you and know who you are. So you need to get known as making doing repairs. Um, that was a basic job right there, that paint Duracoat for a Ruger. Okay, things like that. That's going to make you money. That's, those are the kind of things you're going to be looking at. And that's why I'm touching on this tool thing real quick is because I hear so many yep. of them think they have to go out and buy lathes and mills and all that. But, folks, what good is you if you buy that stuff at fifteen, sixteen thousand dollars $16,000 a pop if you don't even know how to use it? Right. What would you start with? What's your baseline tool preference to, to get started? My basic preference is a good set of, of, in fact, we give you a lot of this stuff at SCI, a uh, good set of screwdrivers. Okay, you're going to need great screwdrivers and gunsmithing screwdrivers. And those of you who have a mill I'm talking about, um, we, you're definitely going to need those because they're, they're hollow brown. They're made a special way for gunsmithing to fit the slots. When you're working on a browning, uh, A5, you're really going to need those screwdrivers because they're precise fit, and if anyone who's worked on one knows you don't want to mess up that finish, and they protect that a lot. Also, you're going to need some ball peen hammers, some basic pliers, you're going to need um, a, a socket set. These are just some of the basic things you're going to need that, that will get you going. Machine-wise, I believe in Dremels, I believe in Fordhams, I believe in, in a drill press, I believe in, in a sander. I believe in uh, uh, even a chop saw if you have one. There's a lot of things that you may already have in your shop. You'll use them when you're doing stocks. Because remember, guys, if you're in a hunting area, but I I would say that um, you're 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 going to get a lot of people come and say, "Hey, I need a a stock cut down for my child." I got a lot of that in hunting areas and stuff like that. To fit, to fit properly. So you're going to do that. You're going to do butt stocks. You're going to do uh, uh, you're going to do a lot of uh, uh, pads. So you need those are the basic stuff you need. And trust me, Brownells and, and uh, Midway and all of them out there, they all they all have everything you could ever want. Uh, you can shop on eBay and find a lot of things. But those are just some basic things you're going to need. I mean, I really could spend two hours. Just talking about tools, sure. but and maybe that's what me and Jennifer need to do in the future. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I, I like but, it. Yeah, you know, because I, I get these I get these questions a lot, and uh, Absolutely. but that's that's where you start with. But don't be intimidated. Just just know you need some basic stuff. Right. Um, Ian wants to know if um, is getting into custom coatings like Seracoat worth worth the upfront investment from what you're seeing in the marketplace right now. You know what? Um, I will say this. Um, I started out with a Duracoat product when it came out. It was great. It was hot. It was a new thing. The Seracoat showed up. Um, yes, you can make money Seracoating. Okay. You can make some really good money Seracoating, but there is some expenses, and he obviously has done his homework. Uh, Seracoat's not cheap. The ovens are not cheap. Um, there's a lot of different guys out there who show you how to make your own ovens and things like that. Uh, for, and and uh, But yes, if you want to get into Seracoating, and finishing, and you're good at finishing, why not? It's good money, and it's very hot right now. Okay, cool. Um, okay, let me see here. There are a couple questions here. I think we covered most of the general tool ones. 
I want to, there was a couple right at the beginning that I wanted to make sure we did. Um, you know what, while I'm searching through, um, let's go ahead and do this one. Oh gosh, people are chiming in with, what about hydro dipping? What about plating? Any Anything like that? Okay, that you okay, I'll cover that while Jennifer's okay. looking for the other cool. one. Hydro dipping, yes, that, that can be a market. You can make some money in. It's really not hard. We offer a kit. We actually teach you how to do that SDI. Check with our people. They can set you up with that. Uh, plating, plating is something that's very, very a different step. It's not only going to be costly to get the stuff to do it, but you're also going to have the EPA dropping down your back. Remember, folks, anything you do that has hazardous materials, uh, volatile chemicals, anything like that, it's going to be regulated by the EPA, and they are very strict on how you handle it, discharge it, get rid of it, and what you do with it, and where you do it at. So, you know, this is why if you go through our thing where we have, a, we tell you to set up a boiling room, it's separate with ventilation and things of that nature. That's because EPA is going to come in and they're going to look at these things as well as maybe OSHA. And so you're getting to a whole world there when it comes to plating. I'm not saying plating is a bad thing. If you have the money and the time, the talent, and the place to do it, then go for it. It's that simple. Okay, cool. Um, I want to go over um, a person on the line named Tobis, uh, t excuse me, Tobin, um, has a couple really good questions here. One is ways to seek out distributors for retail products related to the firearms industry. So, and, and a couple other people had asked something similar. How do you decide where you get the parts? How do you decide um, where you find your distributors? Things like that. Well, most of them, once you get that, okay, here's, here's a little thing you're going to find out. When you get that FFL, probably within the first month of you receiving that FFL, be prepared to get all the junk mail. Because just about everybody out there, when you get an FFL, they have already got you on a list as soon as your FFL is issued, and all these people start reaching out to you. Okay. So be how prepared. Do they sift other, other than that, yeah. How do you sift that, through that? Well, other than that, you're going to have to look at the, what parts you're looking for. I mean, we all know about Numrich, Brownells, Vendway USA, all them. But let me tell you about that. If you're with SDI, you can get a discount from Brownells. That's mm -hmm. first of all. You can also get one through Numrich if you're a gunsmith. Okay? And several other out there um, that that I dealt with. Um, there's one that I haven't really gone into too much with. Uh, I'm talking to Gary about it first. Let him do some research. We may be featuring them with SDI. They're full of a lot of great old parts as well as yeah. new parts. Yeah. Um, but, but And they won't deal with anybody who does not have an FFL. So, you know, that's that's uh, they're out there, folks, and you'll find them. Once once you get into this business, you're going to find them. They're, a lot of them are going to reach out to you. So don't be freaking out. You, you'll get uh, all kinds of things. Um, did you join a gunsmithing guild, or is that something that you would recommend looking into? You know, I looked into it, wanted to be part of it, and I never really found one that I felt was valid. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've often thought about starting one, <laughs> actually, believe it or not, cool. an association of gunsmiths. Um, I have never really found one that I felt was a legitimate, true-on-true, -true blue uh, gunsmithing guild. Um, it, <sighs> gunsmiths are really fickle people, let me just say this. <laughs> You can say that because you are one, right? You're going to have a you're going to have a lot of gunsmiths guys out there. It's not going to want to help you. They're not going to want anybody to know what they're doing. They don't want to share. You have some out there that have been over backwards too, but a lot of them are very closed-minded when it comes to I don't want anybody taking my bucks. So right. That that's something I would love to see happen, but it, it, I have not seen a legit, real legitimate one, sir yet where I've been to the shot show and said, wow, here they are. And if there was one out there, they would definitely be at the shot show saying, here we are. And um, it hasn't happened yet. And that's another thing, folks. Get that FFL, you get to go to the greatest gun show in the world every January. <laughs> so it opens a lot of doors there, too. You talk about networking, that's a place to network. Okay, great. Good, good, good. Okay. A um, couple people are asking what to carry um, from, a, it sounds like a retail perspective when you first start out. So if you're gunsmithing but you want to do a storefront, what would you recommend? 
Well, it depends on your budget. You, you can only do what your budget will allow you to do. Um, I suggest carrying some very basic stuff first. Something that's related to your shop that, that the customer is going to have an interest in. Maybe some cleaning products, maybe um, some holsters, maybe some sights. Anything where they buy it, you can put it on for them. That, that keep that kind of mindset. If I put something in my shop, I want to be able to be able to put it on for them, make a buck. You got to think this way, folks. You're a business. You got to pay bills. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Nathan says, "What about an SDI school guild?" <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? I think I think I think we have an alumni now. And, We're working uh, on that. Yep. What career yep, services and, uh, is working on an alumni. Right. I know Mike is working real hard. Yeah. I know Mike has a couple of associations for fraternities. Yep. For some of our students that graduate. So yeah, you know. They might have, maybe I'll have a bust of me one day somewhere. No, That's no, right. Kidding. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't do that. They don't know my sense of humor yet. All right, well. <laughs> but that's the um, thing, folks. That's the thing. Be humble. Be humble that's, in your business. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And, and that goes back to what you were talking about before, treating people fairly, being honest. You know. Oh, God, yes. I, I, you know, it, Jennifer knows me. A lot of people know me. Say, they know me for more of my sense of humor than anything. I don't take myself that serious. Yes, <laughs> I'll stand up. Yes, I'll stand up for myself, and I'll say it now. I know what I'm doing when it comes to gunsmithing. Yep. But I don't act like I do because, you know, there's too many egos out there. Don't ever have an ego because if you don't, People want to teach you things. They want to show you things. And any way you can build up your portfolio of knowledge, it's worth it. Just be yourself. Have a good time. And respect everybody on their level. Um, okay. I've got a couple. You know what? Let me, let me address this first. A couple of people asked about how to get that SDI student discount through Brownells. Um, SDI has tons and tons of student discounts available to you. Um not the least of which is Brownells, obviously, Midway, things like that. Um, the best way to look into that whole thing is it once you're a student, um, you're entered into, you know, you, you know that you're obviously in the system. And then monthly, I think it's always at the beginning of the month, somewhere in that first week of the month, you'll get an email that says your SDA um, resource guide, I do believe. And there will be a little hyperlink in there that'll have that month's resource guide. We try to get a new fresh one out just about every month. Um, and that will have all of the discounts and the way that you get the discounts as well. So for the Brownells one, it'll talk you through, like, here's what you need to do to get the discount. That one's a little bit more in-depth, I think, from of a process um, than some of the other ones are. If that doesn't ring a bell at all, if you've never seen one of those emails and you're a current student, um, reach out to your student services advisor and just say, hey, I'm hearing about a resource guide, but I don't know what that is. Maybe it hit your spam folder or something along those lines. Um, but they can get you uh, the most recent one of those, and then you'll be able to see all of the discounts and everything, too. So we want you to use those if you can. Um, okay, people are asking about, and I, I definitely want to go over this, Kip, logbooks. Um, yes. Can you talk about systems a little bit, that type of thing? Sure. Logbooks is the most important part of your business. That's what's going to keep you in the good with the ATF and liability and everything else. It's really simple to do, folks. Uh, let me just see if I can just explain it to you very simply. I have a gunsmithing book. That's a log book. And it's just what it is. Customer brings in the gun. You, the customer. In that log book, I put the make, the model, the serial number, the caliber, and one side of the column. Then I put you, the customer's name, address, telephone number in the end of the column. It sits there. I've logged it in. Um, I used a ticket system where I had, you know, my, my uh, uh, tags, and I gave the customer, it had a tear-away portion for them so they with a claim number. The customer, then I put that little claim number. There's a little box area for you to put that in there, believe it or not. You put that in there. And then when the customer, you come back to get your firearm, I do the same thing over again. The same make, you have your acquisition and disposition. So you take it in, then you lock it right back out to the customer. And let me make something clear on that. There's always a lot of controversy about this. If you're Joe Smith and you bring me that firearm, only Joe Smith can come pick up that firearm. Not Joe Smith's wife, not Joe Smith's brother, not Joe Smith's son. 
If they do, they must be in the legal age of, of owning a firearm and they must fill out a background check to pick that up. So make sure your customers know that. Are you the one going to pick up this firearm? No, my wife is. So let her definitely because they will get you for that. Remember, it goes to the person that signed it in and nobody else. And you cannot release it legally to anyone but that person unless that person has given you permission to do so and then they have to fill out the appropriate paperwork. So it's really just that simple. Every time you get one in, you put it in. Every time you get rid of it, it goes logged out. Whether it's a gun you've taken in to be sold or whether it's a, a uh, gun for your personal collection, you have to log everything in the same way. You have to log it in yourself to, to you. Okay, that's what I always did. I got this Glock. I put it in my firearms book. Then I depositioned it out for me. Now let's touch on that one. If you're going to sell firearms, you're going to have two books. One's going to say gunsmithing, one's going to say firearm sales. That's, that's how you have to do it by ATF. Yeah. So you keep them separate. Okay, so anything yeah, that's, that's gunsmithing related? Okay. Go ahead. Nope, so I was just saying, I'm, I'm glad you did that. Um, somebody asked specifically that question. So whoever that was, he just answered it. <laughs> right. So make sure that you put everything in your gunsmithing book that's gunsmithing, repair related, and customized. Anything that's to be sold or taken in on trade or for yourself to give to yourself goes into the firearm sales book. As long as you do those things and you keep accurate records, you are never going to have it because when they come in and do an audit, that's what they do. They look at the books. They look at everything that you say is in the shop. They go and verify that those guns are in the shop, and they verify that, yes, you logged everything out properly. Have a nice day. That's it. If you don't do it, then you're looking at fines. You can have your FFL taken from you. You can have a lot of nightmares. Don't do it. Just follow the rules. It's really simple, and just do it the way they tell you to do it. Um, people are asking for the logbook. Uh, do you recommend, or did you do hard copy or electronic? I did hard copy. I, I, I uh, electronic. I know is a new thing, but I'm always I'm one of those persons. I'm 53, folks. So, in fact, I'll be 54 in April, but. I'm one of those old guys that, that believe that computers screw up too much, <laughs> so I like to have a written copy because I know as long as I have that written copy, it's written in stone in my handwriting, and it's and I can verify that in a court of law. Okay, great. Um, a couple of people have asked about what type of safes or cages you would recommend, um, even as a starter level, or you know what I mean. How how would you recommend they go about that? I know that there's not much in the frame of a, of a requirement, you know what I mean, but what would your recommendation be? Well, when I had my biggest shop, I had a big Sentry uh, armor safe. And I'm talking, most of you have been to your local sporting goods store and probably know the exact one I'm saying. Usually they put them on sale for less than two grand, but they're huge, they're heavy, you can't lift them. That's what I had in my big shop. Small shop. I had just a regular chest size safe that was secured, fireproof, you know, it was a sentry uh, combination. That's what I used to start with, and it was far out fine, but then as I got into the bigger shop, I wanted something more secure, more permanent, um, so I went to the bigger safes. And, and let me tell you something, folks. If you're doing your business right, when you got to that level like we did, it, it wasn't hard to spend two grand on a safe. It really wasn't, and it also helped my insurance out immensely. So, <clears throat> you know, I locked everything up at night, kept everything in there. It worked out perfectly. Um, you pick your name you want, but Liberty is a great one. Citry is a great one. Um, all those, those just a good reputable safe is all you need. Perfect. I had a couple guys. Um, somebody asked a really cool question. Um, oh. How do you, what do you look for, let's say everything's going swimmingly um, and you're ready to expand. What sort of credentials would you look for in a new hire? Um, if you were going to bring somebody <laughs> on or partner with somebody or bring in an assistant or an apprentice well, or anything like that. What first thing I ask them is they went to SCI. <laughs> oh, geez, I just teed that up for you, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll kid aside, I, I would ask them to have any kind of background. Um, the, I'll be honest with you, the first thing I'm going to measure up is I'm going to look at your work record. 
I'm going to look at your your personality. I'm going to look at you as a person before I look at anything else to see if I can stand working with you. <laughs> to be honest with you, the um, uh, reason I say yeah. that, folks, is is um, you know my generation looks for someone who's had to work hard <laughs> like I have, and I want to know that every day that I open my shop. If I'm going to invest all my time to teach you and, and help you expand on what you know, I want to know that I'm going to get something out of it. I don't want the person that's just going to be there for four months and then leave and and uh, take off, you know. And you're going to find that that's the way most gunsmiths are. Gunsmiths are, like I said, they're very finicky people. They're very some don't even want apprentices for that reason. They've tried and it hasn't worked out. I'm not that way. Um, I believe apprentices is good. I think it goes hand in hand with what you learn, but I think you need a basic education first because that gives you the basics and it gives you enough knowledge that, that you can come right in there and pick up quick and then what you don't know I can help you learn on and go from there. And I think you'll find that a lot of scumsmiths have done just that. Great. Um, I have one that I really want to uh, get Ah, there it is. Um, Mark asked, what are some of the mistakes that you have seen um, that result in the failure of a gunsmithing business? <laughs> well, <laughs> there, there's many things, Mark, I'd be honest with you. Um, not knowing how to market yourself, and this is going to be a good time, I'm going to let Jennifer get jump in here, because you guys really need to know about marketing. Um, Marketing can be very inexpensive, and there's lots of resources, and I have done a lot of these things that she's going to talk about. But uh, Jennifer, I want you to just jump in real quick and talk about marketing, and then I'll go into some of the other pitfalls sure. as soon as you're done. Yeah, um, and w and I'll try to keep this really brief because I know that, um, uh, Michael, I, I see your ammo manufacturing question. I, I will get to that. Um, I know that the president is speaking right now, so we will <laughs> we'll try to jump off soon. Um, as far as hey, marketing goes, uh, yeah, you um, you definitely want to start with uh, what I would consider um, a basis of a brand. So you know what I mean. You want to figure out what your logo is going to look like, what your website's going to look like, and you really, really should have a website um, in this day and age. Hire somebody cheap to do it, or do it on your own through a Wix or a um, Homestead or a you know even a WordPress. Although that can be a little bit dicey. Um, Definitely web page or uh, website, even if it's very brief. Um, definitely logo. Um, definitely business cards, and they should all match. Make sure you're doing the same fonts. Make sure you're um, putting your address on the same way and your telephone, same telephone number everywhere, same contact information everywhere. Um, that is 101. You know what I mean? If you're going to do nothing else, you have to do those things. Um, Beyond that, and beyond what Kip has talked about already as far as networking and word of mouth goes, because he has mentioned a couple things that are really invaluable tonight, um, whether it be with the uh, law enforcement or um, knocking on the gunsmith stores and things like that, those are all really great ways to kind of guerrilla market yourself. Um, if you want to do more of an online presence type of thing, build yourself a Facebook account, build yourself a Twitter account. Build yourself an Instagram account. Instagram for you guys is probably going to be the easiest um, social media platform to take part in because you're going to be working with guns all the time. So snap a picture, snap a picture, snap a picture, snap a picture. You don't have to worry about crafting, um, you know, grammatically correct, you know, captions or anything like that. Should be easy peasy for you. So um, that would be kind of the next level, in my opinion, would be doing some social Facebook, Twitter, Instagram type of things, right? Beyond that, then, um, you're going to get lots and lots of calls from people who are offering to do search engine optimization for you. Um, my recommendation is first starting out not to mess with any of that. Um, it, you shouldn't necessarily rely solely on your Google ranking um, to drive people into your door. You want to be doing all of that stuff that Kip was talking about. Um, and then also, um, one of the ways to boost your Google ranking without paying somebody to work on what they call SEO, search engine optimization, um, is to make sure that everybody that has a, a good, you know, experience at your shop or a good experience with you, um, have them jump on to um, Google, find your Google listing, claim your Google listing. It just actually, if you don't know what I'm talking about at all, Google, claim my Google listing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Go to Google. Um, walk yourself through that process. It's pretty simple. Um, 
and you want those people to, to give you reviews. So if I could give you any one second piece of information when it comes to search engine optimization and rankings, um, have people give you reviews and have them do it in kind of what, the, what Google would consider an organic way, um, which would be you don't want 50 people doing it on the same day. And that's the same thing when I talk about reviews. Google's probably the best, but of course Yelp and Manta and a couple other of those um, are just as good uh, for word of mouth type of things, not necessarily Google ranking stuff. So if you're going to focus on one, I would go with um, Google, and second would probably be Yelp, and third would be anything else that happens that's uh, you know big in your area. Um, like I said, they'll be very careful not to incentivize people to do that. So you're not saying, hey, if you do that, um, I'll give you $5 off your ne next service, because then you're going to get a whole bunch of people in a three-day time period um, and their algorithms are going to pick that up as something that you may be incentivized for or something like that. And they will, the, this is the worst because you've worked for these, um, they will not show those. If, if something gets flagged as potentially you're forcing people to do reviews or something like that, the algorithms within Google and Yelp and Manta and all those will flag those and then hide them. So that's, we don't want that to happen. Um, it's basically digital word of mouth doing those reviews. So basic branding, you know, things like your website and your logo and your business card and all of that good stuff, social media, um, and that's going to be however much time you want to put into it from zero minutes to all the time, you know, um, and then reviews. And I would, like I said, I would recommend starting with Google and maybe the big one, which is, which is Yelp right now, unless there's one that's really big in your area. So if everybody's on TripAdvisor, if everybody's on City Search or something like that. Um, you should be able to sniff that out a little bit, um, and you may want to do a little bit there. But, but like I said, I would recommend Google and Yelp um, slow trickle of reviews in. Those are my, that's my little five minute spiel <laughs> as far as um, <laughs> online marketing goes. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And another thing, like Jennifer said, what I said before, I told you guys, get to know your community. Whenever you have a local little uh, uh, sportsman show or anything comes to your town, be there. Be there, set up a booth, and just pass out cards and, and little, whatever it is you got there. Put something on display. It doesn't matter. I don't care if you give out candy. Just be there. And it usually doesn't cost much or very little to do that. Also, friends of the NRA, uh, they do banquets. They do fundraising. And this is all about shooting sports for kids. That is a awesome thing to do and will help get your name out there in the firearm community where you live. So that's another thing. Anything you guys can do, just reach out to the community. Let them, let them know that you're here and you're there and you're contributing, and you get you you'd be surprised how it'll work out for you. Absolutely. Okay. Um. Let me see, guys. Uh. Looks like some of these. How does it transfer to new FFL transferring it to new location? I'm only asking you this because I know that you've had to do it. Um. Do you know what that Double process time. is like? <laughs> yes, you just you just basically just fill out a form. That's it. Okay, you fill easy. Out a form. Okay. You fill good, out good, a form. Good. If they want to check it out, they'll check it out. If not, usually usually takes about thirty or so days or so. So so you, you want to do it in advance before prior to moving because once you move out of the facility that your FFL is registered to, you can't do any more business until you get the new FFL for the new building. However, if you know you're going to be moving in two months. In two months, before you move, send it out. Let them know where you're going, and that allows you to stay in business. So all you have to do is just say, "I'm going to be closed for a week to move," and you're back in business. Okay, cool. Um, any good ways uh, to go about setting prices in your area? And somebody else asked about your opinion on um, charging kind of a flat fee for certain for um, you know bluing. You know what I mean? That type of thing, a flat fee for particular. Well, there's a myth about bluing. Bluing is never a flat fee because you don't know what you're dealing with. Uh, okay. Bluing itself is not the expense. It's the prep work. You don't know how bad the metal is until you've got until you have it in your hands and then you know. Okay, guys, you know if I charge you seventy-five dollars to uh, say, okay, well I'll just prep it for seventy-five, and you come in and that thing is so pitted that I can no way I can get the pits out, or I have to do a lot of things by file or. Anything. That's where you're going to learn. Once you learn how to blue, you'll understand all these processes I'm talking about. It can be very time consuming. So you never want to just get yourself in. You can say that my average price for a bluing job usually runs for this. 
and how you price it out, you price out other gunsmiths. I'm sorry to say it, but that's what everybody does. Sure. You find out you find out on the internet in the area what people are charging, and or even by calling and just ask, and that's how you do it. Um, because they're going to do it to you. So that's yeah, just, absolutely. I just call, like, I just call like you. Any did, industry you know? does that, you know. Sure, it is. It's called pricing out shopping. So yeah. you know we. Have all about shopping out our competition, so okay. you know even even the supermarkets do it. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so um, you know, oh, that's sorry, what you have to do. No, no, I just want to say so that's pretty much what you have to do to get going. Like I said, there's no set in stone anything of here's how what you charge. Right. There's no job or books out there. Okay. Um, Michael wants to know if you have any advice for ammo manufacturing. I stay away from ammo manufacturing, Man, but yes, you can get an FFL license to manufacture ammo and sell ammo. Um, Michael, you're probably your biggest challenge and one of your biggest expenses is going to be the insurance. I understand it can be quite costly because of the liability issue of it. Um, but yes, if you want to do it, you can do it. I never did it. Um, I just didn't want the headache of it. But yes, if you want to be a, a uh, ammo manufacturer, you certainly can apply for the license and do it. Okay, perfect. Um, Raymond is asking, do you need to log your own firearms that you work on? Like yes. If you're, okay. Yes, once you're a firearms, once you're an FFL, you're an FFL. Okay? So it's just common sense, man. You want to log in your firearms, and it just protects you. Okay? Yeah, you can you can log it right back out to yourself as saying, "Hey, this has been logged out to me. Here's my FFL number for my private collection." You do have to put something in there like that, and I, and I've done that many times. It's like, okay, I bought this gun for me. It's it's not a big deal. It's just that you still have to record it though. Um, somebody else asked, "Will I have to register my personal firearm with FFL?" Um, no. Okay. The personal anything you owned prior to becoming an FFL, no. Anything you acquire after getting an FFL, yes. Okay. Just that simple. Okay, perfect. And you are. And can you? Here, real quick, real quick. Yeah. I didn't mean to cut you off. Real quick. No, no. And one thing, one thing that they do like you to do is if you have guns in the same facility, they want you to keep yours separate from the customers. I was okay. That's exactly what I was just going to ask. So <laughs> no problem cutting me off. That's what I was going to ask. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, guys, looks like we're winding down a little bit. If anybody has any burning questions, pop them in now while I kind of take a look through some of these. Um, I think we're in good shape, though. Oh, um, have you noticed that being certified – um, get you, gets you extra benefits with companies like Smith & Wesson or Mossberg or anything? Like, will they sell you parts that are restricted, trigger group parts, things like that? Tyler, you know what? That's an interesting question because technically the answer is no, but, but I'm going to tell you yes, and I'll okay. tell you why. There has been some parts that I needed, and including Smith & Wesson, who is a bear, we all know that, to get things from. After talking with me, and listening to me and working with me, they determined that I knew what I was talking about, and they gave me several parts that normally is is not not uh, approved. So, okay. yes, I think it can get you some benefits like that. I know it sure did with Taurus with me, and now we have a working relationship with Taurus, oh, so that's even cooler. Absolutely, and if you guys um, haven't yet. If you we we do these webinars on a monthly basis. Um, we had a really cool webinar with Kimberly and Tagliata from Taurus a couple months, two months ago, I think. Um, I think December, yeah. She's really great. Um, she's been popping by a lot of our booths at the big events as well. So if you haven't checked that out, go check that out. You can see all of Kip's past webinars too as an added bonus. <laughs> um, okay, I want to ask Hanson's question here. Do you recommend starting out working for somebody who is established or immediately starting up a personal shop? Well, there again, it's up to you and your confidence level. Um, if you feel like that you would like to work next to a gunsmith, there's nothing wrong with that. It's perfectly acceptable. I, I commend you for it. I mean, you may just say, hey, I just don't feel confident doing my own thing yet. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. A man or a woman who can ask themselves and tell themselves truthfully what their limitations are, they're the ones that are going to succeed. 
and you will succeed. So if you feel that you need to do that first, um, usually the second question I get to that is how do I get an apprenticeship? I, like I said before, go in, introduce yourself, be humble, have the right attitude and the eagerness to learn and show that they have you have that eagerness to learn. That's the first things they're going to look for. The guy that's going to come in there and tell them how to do things, forget it. It's not going to happen. So just just be humble, be yourself, be honest, and talk to your local Smiths and then if you you may find that you don't have any choice but to just do your thing and just do what you know how to do. If all you do is repair and replace parts and clean guns, that's fine. Because you make money doing that too. I made money cleaning guns. I had lots of customers that didn't know how to clean a gun and say, here, clean it. You know, so you can if you want to know I charge, thirty bucks. So complete strip detailed cleaned. And I used to have them bring me guns by the handfuls in there. So awesome. Um, anything special when dealing with fully automatic weapons versus civilian? <laughs> okay, now we're getting to the slippery slope. Um, <laughs> automatic weapons, automatic weapons, you are allowed to work on with your FFL okay. as a gunsmith. However, there are some stipulations. First stipulation is on the gun owner himself. The gun owner it must be there when you're working on the firearms and to CYA your rear end, and this came from my ATF agent, let the ATF know that you have this automatic firearm in your shop and you're going to be working on it and you want them to be aware. That is just a CYA for you. Okay? So there, therefore, if the person you are not 100% sure is on the legit or if they can't produce the right uh, licenses and things like that, and you'll know what I'm talking about. Any, any of you who know automatic weapons, you already know where I'm coming from. There are certain stamps and licenses they have to carry with them anywhere they right. go, even with a, a, uh, a suppressor or anything. Well, it's the same way. If they can't produce anything, have a nice day. I can't take your guns. Don't do it. If somebody walks in with an automatic weapon that was left in granddaddy's clock from the, or his uh, closet from World War II and it's fully automatic and they don't have paperwork, get it out of your shop and suggest to them that they call the ATF and try to go the right way or turn it in. But do not take anything in that does not have proper paperwork and always notify the ATF when you're working on those guns. It will save you a lot of headache. It may even save you from going to jail. Any idea what the process is like to get your class three? Uh, we're talking pretty about much it? the same. Pretty much okay. the same as you do anything. You're going to fill it out and you're going to uh, apply all the, the proper paperwork and along with the appropriate fees and then you wait the process and they'll either say yes or they're going to say no. Right, okay. Okay, cool. Um, let me see here. Is warranty, oh yeah, that's right, warranties. A couple people asked about whether or not warranties are worth getting into, warranty jobs and that type of thing. Uh, warranty, if you can get it, is great. There's very few gunsmiths who get to do warranty work. I'll tell you that right now. Most manufacturers do not warranty outside of their own corporations and manufacturing plants for liability reasons. It's that simple. Okay. All right, all right, all right. Um, this one I don't know if you'll know. I work at a shop as a gunsmith building full autos. Is told that technically we're not allowed to ask for their tax stamp or paperwork because it's considered a tax document and their personal papers. Is that true? Do you know anything about that? Um, I'm going to refer him to the ATF. Okay. On that question there, that's that's where you're getting into one of those gray matters that I don't want sure. me or Jennifer or the SDI to be involved in. Yep. Um, I would say to you that I would probably disagree with that statement. And I would suggest that you might want to talk to your local ATF for more guidance on dealing with that situation. Okay, perfect. Good. Um, I think we're in good shape then. Since we're going over a little bit, and I know there's interesting stuff on TV, <laughs> let's go ahead and wrap it up. Um, there, just so everybody knows, a couple people have asked, and we, we I have recorded this entire session, um, what typically happens is it'll take me a day or two to get it up on YouTube, but once it's there, it's there for you to see. I'll try to post it to the Facebook page as well. Um, 
So keep an eye out for that over the next couple days. If you have any follow-up questions for me or Kip or anything like that, feel free to email me, jennifer, at sci.edu or webinar at sci.edu. Either one of those work. Um, we have really enjoyed tonight's session, Kip. I, I really thank you for that. Um, and uh, it seems like these are always kind of the most popular of the sessions. So I thank you so much for your time tonight and for getting into all of these details. Um, and guys, if you have any uh, ideas for us for future webinars, shoot them over to me via email or, uh, like I said, jennifer at sci.edu or webinar at sci.edu. We're always looking for that type of insight from you guys. Um, but I promise I will have Kip on here more often than once every six months, like I did this last time. <laughs> so. The time period, we were in a lot, but, but yeah, but yeah. Jennifer, it's no problem. I enjoy being here, and to the students out there and potential students, I enjoy being here. Um, my students come first, as well as everybody at SDI, we put our students first. And we just wanted to give the best information we can out there, and it's always a pleasure, Jennifer, uh, being with you on these webinars. Absolutely. Thanks, guys, for being with us. And again, let us know if you have any questions at all. Um, I'm not sure who we've got on next month, but uh, we're still kind of nailing that, that down. We've got a couple really exciting guests in the coming months. Um, keep an eye out over the next couple weeks um, to see who's going to be on for the webinars. If you don't get our newsletters, we will be doing newsletters again. Um, I think the next one's going out the, uh, probably next week sometime, I think. And we're hoping to have some webinar information in there. If you do not get those, um, and you would like to, go over to sdi.edu, scroll down to the bottom of the page. There's a little thing that says sign up for newsletters if you'd like that. So thank you so much, everybody, for your time. So many of you guys stuck it out to the very end, and I really appreciate that. Um, and like I said, I will have this up for you in the next couple days. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night. Bye-bye. Good night, everybody.